Good morning and welcome to Foundry United Methodist Church as we gather together online for worship today. How many blessings we have already received and we are just getting started as we move into this time of worship and we are truly glad that you are coming alongside to be with us. My name is Ginger Gaines Sorelli. I'm the senior pastor at Foundry and on behalf of all of our pastors and our staff, we welcome you. We are so glad that you are here. We invite you to participate with us fully in our service today. You can do that in a variety of ways. Uh, we'll be lighting our candles together in a minute, so if you have a candle and a way to light it, we invite you to have that nearby. Also, your favorite Bible or Bible app, so that you might read scripture along with us. And throughout these weeks, we encourage, and months, <laughs> we've been encouraging folks to have a vessel of water in kind of a sacred space that we create together for these times of worship each Sunday. A reminder of God's presence with us, the wellspring of life bubbling up for us. We also invite you to connect with the links that you'll find on in our streams. That'll help you find our worship guide and the ASL interpretation page that you can use if that serves you today. We also uh, encourage you to go to our website and there's a button where you can check in to let us know that you're joining us today. We imagine we may have a number of folks who are with us for worship today for the first time because certainly we have a wonderful guest preacher today who might have been extra invitation and inducement for you to come and be here. So we welcome all of you. We'd love to know you're here and you can easily let us know that on our website. There's a, a Easy, easy little link that you can let us know you're here. Friends, we uh, now will move into that time of lighting our candles together, creating sacred space together. And we're going to be led today by servant leader, Rhea. Welcome to Foundry. You are now invited to join us into a sacred space of worship. You may light your candles now. Won't you please join me in our call to worship? A voice cries out in the world's wilderness places, proclaiming release for the held captive, liberation for the oppressed, and justice that rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Will you receive its invitation? Yes, let justice roll. It is the voice of liberation, which called to Moses from a burning bush, sending him to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. It is the voice of hope with which Mary proclaimed God's faithfulness when her child left in her womb. It is the voice of anticipation with which Philip, daring to follow Jesus, invited others to come and see. How will we respond? Here I am, Lord. Send me. It is the faithful voice of Mother Pollard when she said, My feet is tired, but my soul is rested. It is the world weary voice of Rosa Parks saying no when she refused to move to the back of a bus. It is the guiding voice of Dr. King, still unsilenced after 52 years proclaiming a dream of equity, equality, and justice for all people, no matter the color of their skin. Will you speak too? Yes, let justice roll. A voice cries out in the world's wilderness places, places of injustice, places of violence, places ruled by white supremacy and defined by white Christian nationalism. Echoing through time, it calls to us still, Casting a vision for beloved community, we are called to co-create. Are we ready to respond? Yes. Let justice roll. Amen. Amen. And now, friends, join us in singing our response, Let Justice Roll, as originally recorded at Foundry on September 1st of 2019.
Friends, no matter where you are coming from today, no matter where you go at the close of this time of worship, no matter what you believe or doubt, no matter what you feel or don't feel today, no matter your immigration status, no matter whom you love, you're welcome to come just as you are, to be met by our God who knows you by name and who loves you and who wants to have an ever closer relationship with you. We welcome you. And we'll continue in our worship by singing together our opening hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing. It's number 519 in the United Methodist Hymnal, and you'll find the words to sing with us on the lower third of your stream or in the worship guide. Let's sing. Pastor Casey Van Atta Casebeer, Associate Pastor and Director of Family Ministries at Foundry. I would like to welcome all of you to worship on this beautiful Sunday, but especially our young friends. Kids, I want to invite you to gather close to the screen so we can pick up on a conversation that we had last week. Last week, we talked about knowing ourselves and seeing ourselves as beloved. And first, I want to tell you something about me. 
I grew up in a really small town that was not far from a place called Selma, Alabama. And today I want to show you a couple pictures that I took a little while ago when I went back to visit my family and I took my kiddos to Selma so that I could show them some of the meaningful places that you will find there. And one of those places is the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And you'll see that bridge right here in this picture. We walked across this bridge and we talked about the heroism of John Lewis. The next place that we went was the Brown Chapel AME Church, where we talked about another person. Hmm, who could that person be? Who do you see in this picture? That's right, it's Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Now, I want to talk to you about our scripture today that Pastor Lonnie is going to read to us. We will hear how God knows and sees us. Last week, we talked about knowing and seeing ourselves. So let's talk about God knowing and seeing us. The writer in the scripture is talking to God and says some of these things. You know all about me. You know when I sit down and when I get up. You know my thoughts even before I think them. Can you imagine that? God knows your thoughts even before you think them. You know where I go. You know everything that I do. This scripture from the Bible reminds me that God knows me better than I even know myself. So that means that God knows everything about me and in the fullness of that like we learned last week god calls me beloved and it also reminds me that if god thinks that about me then who else does god know and call beloved what do you think yeah, you guessed it. Every single person is known and called beloved as a member of the human family. Everybody in the fullness of who they are. And do you know who knew that and believed that and showed up and marched for that and worked tirelessly for that? Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, whose statue is right outside the Brown Chapel AME Church and who we get to celebrate tomorrow. Let's pray. God help us to know that there is no one outside of the human family. Encourage us through the life and witness of Reverend Dr. King and so many others to continue to work tirelessly for justice in our community and in our country. Help us to remember that we are known and we are seen by you. And that helps us to know and to see ourselves and to know and to see each and every person regardless of who they are as beloved and as members of the human family. And all God's children say together, Amen. All right, kids, now you can back away from the screen a little bit. And now it's time to go for a time of prayer with Pastor Kelly. Thank you, Pastor Casey. Uh, this is Reverend Dr. Kelly Grimes. I have the honor of being the Director of Hospitality and Congregational Care at Foundry. Good morning. If you are watching from live stream, you will find links to request prayer in our Facebook Live comments or on our homepage on our website. As we prepare for prayer, please keep the following persons in your hearts. Jean Poocher, Frances Prince and her husband, Norman, who cares for her, Leslie Kirk, Joan Williams, Mary Jane Gilliatt, for Amelia, sister of Miss Rosa Vega, who is recovering from following a hospital stay, 
for the family of Kirk Griffin, who passed on Tuesday following a brief illness. We pray for the family of Reverend Kenneth Johnson, grandfather of foundry member Becky Ballard, following his death earlier this week. And we also lift up prayers for his wife, Evelyn, who is in the hospital recuperating from an illness. We pray for foundry mem member Will Rumble, who is recovering from surgery early, earlier this week. We are praying for Mary Lou Camizo, cousin of foundry member Steve Zagami, who is in long-term care and ill. We pray for family uh, foundry member Nancy Burton as she prepares for surgery next week. We pray for the family of Mildred Matthews Brewster, aunt of foundry member Max Brewster, who passed on Wednesday. She was 93 years old. We celebrate and pray for Sarah Hasmer, uh, a foundry member and newest candidate for ministry who met with and was approved for candidacy by our district committee on ordained ministry this week. We lift up celebration for the birth of Bennett James Howen, son of Susan Howen and brother of Alice, who was born on October the 23rd, 2020. And we pray for our sibling congregations, John Wesley AME Zion Church and Asbury United Methodist Church and all those communities who are faithfully uh, seeking to respond during this pandemic. Friends, as we prepare our hearts for prayer, we invite you to join us in singing hymn number 427 in our African-American heritage hymnal, The Storm is Passing Over, as originally recorded at Foundry on April the 7th, 2019. Let us pray. God of abounding, abounding love, we are so thankful for the opportunity to come to you today in community. As we celebrate the life and ministry of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we are reminded of his words, the ultimate measure of a human is not where they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where they stand in times of challenge and controversy. And in these times of challenge and controversy, we know you are with us. You've called us to stand on the side of goodness and truth. And so God, 
we come standing, praying that you would move us toward justice, guide us toward truth, open our eyes to see the work that must be done and put our hands to the work that we might have beloved community be reality in this world. We come knowing that the work is not always easy and justice and oppression seems to be on every side, but you, O oh Lord, are our refuge and our fortress. You are our God in whom we trust. And it is in this assurance that we do the work of beloved community together, knowing that the time is always right to do what is right. We need your guidance. We need your comfort. We need you. Thank you for your steadfast love toward us and your abounding grace and mercy. We thank you, God. We pray this prayer in the name of the one who we know has come that we might have life and life more abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let us listen to the words of scripture shared with us today by the one and only Pastor Lonnie. Thanks, Pastor Casey. I'm Lonnie Wilbanks, the business administrator for our beloved Foundry community. As we continue together in worship today, I invite you to turn to your Bible or your Bible app to Psalm 139. We will begin with the first verse, and I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Let us receive the word of God. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed me, formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made wonderful are your works that I know so very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end and I'm still with you. Receive what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. Hello friends, if you are just joining us, I want to welcome you. We are so glad that you are coming to share with us today in this time of worship and want to make sure you know that we have ASL interpretation available if that is helpful for you to participate fully today. Last Sunday, we began a new sermon series inspired and animated by Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham City Jail. The image from the letter that I highlighted is one that Reverend Dr. King used on more than one occasion. The contrast between being a thermometer that merely takes the temperature of the status quo and a thermostat that can change the temperature, can change the environment, can change reality. Our guest preacher today is someone who has not been content to just take the temperature, but has devoted his life to changing the thermostat, to making real change in the world for the better. You can find a brief biography of Senator Cory Booker 
in our worship guide, outlining his education, elected offices, and key areas of focus. In 2013, he began his service in the Senate, only the ninth African-American to serve as a United States Senator. He champions criminal justice reform, access to health care, living wages, and other initiatives that seek to bring greater equity and justice to the marginalized and the underserved. Senator Booker's service is, of course, a matter of public record. There's all sorts of information, and I encourage you to learn more about his good work. Today, we give thanks for his dedication as a public servant who truly fights the good fight. But more than that today, we welcome Cory Booker as a sibling, as a fellow child of God, as a companion on the journey of faith, a person with whom we share our common family name, Beloved. We know that his national leadership and public platform require much of him. And especially on this weekend and in this moment, we are deeply honored that he has chosen to spend some time with us in worship and bring a word. I want to thank Senator Cory Booker, our honored guest today. We welcome you and friends following this anthem that we will receive from our chancel choir. We will be blessed to receive the message from Cory Booker. Thanks be to God.
Well, that is what we do at Foundry Church. How about that? <laughs> Senator, we are so happy to welcome you and thank you for being present with us live this morning for worship. We know you are on the move all the time. We are so, so honored and grateful to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. This beats my earlier Meet the Press uh, appearance this morning. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I cannot tell you how humbled I am uh, that I was invited uh, by you all to share a word. And frankly, um, it's a time where I've been struggling a lot with my own uh, faith and seeing so much darkness, a pandemic in our world and seeing uh, so much pain in this economic challenge and seeing a nation where we uh, just saw within our democracy uh, actions uh, that we never imagined. And so I'm humbled to be before you and I'm grateful that you would welcome me as a sibling. And it's in that spirit that when I thought about this King Day, I would let you know that uh, I am still struggling and failing uh, in my attempt to live up to the radical love that Martin Luther King spoke about. And what always uh, used to uh, move me when I began reading his work and especially his sermons, and I just finished recently a book called The Radical King, is how much he talked about the importance of doing some self-investigation. He even would say to people, first, see that you are worthy of being nonviolent, a nonviolent protester. And I love this ideal in King, which he understood that in order to change the world, one must prepare yourself, one must fortify yourself, one must recommit yourself to the difficult gospel of Jesus Christ, the difficult gospel of loving uh, your enemy, loving your neighbor loving unconditionally and radically. And so this morning, very quickly, I, I wanted to maybe put lay it upon the table. I know there's a, a, a thought that sometimes uh, leaders like myself should speak about the world and, and curing the world, but I would rather just share with you two moments of my struggles to live up to the examples of King, the examples of John Lewis, and many of the other heroes uh, that I either read about or knew personally uh, that challenged me to just try to be a better person and we understand that the world will take care of itself. Now, the two failures I would like to share with you in the course of this word is one uh, that is particularly embarrassing to me because of my weakness. Uh, I, when I'm home in New Jersey, have been uh, driven around when I'm doing my work by somebody who's been with me for a long time, a man named Kevin Batts, Officer Kevin Batts, when I met him, he was a police officer on my security details of mayor. He eventually joined my Senate staff and uh, we've been in the car for years and years, and we know each other so well that when I'm in the back making phone calls and doing work, I just need to look at him in the rearview mirror, and he can almost read my mind. Now, I live in a low-income neighborhood in the central ward of Newark. It's where I'm sitting not right now. We don't mistake wealth with worth here, and it's a wonderful community. But we have a lot of these places. I'm not sure if you all have them or ever heard of them, but in a community like mine, we have a lot of these places. They're called McDonald's. And as we were driving by the one about three blocks from my house, I look up in the rear mirror, Kevin looks at me, and he can tell by the look of shame in my face as I lower my head that he knows I want to go through that McDonald's drive through And I'll never forget going through. Now, I'm a vegan, uh, but at this point, I thought McDonald's french fries were vegan. So that's all I wanted was two large McDonald's french fries. I wanted to go home, unbuckle my pants, and watch some escapist TV. And as we were going through the drive through I still remember paying, sheepishly paying, embarrassed about my bounty. And I grab my two large fries. I sit in my uh, uh, back seat and uh, feel holding on to them like I was from a Lord of the Rings movie. My precious, my precious. And just very excited about these fries. But then I look out my window and I see at the end of the drive through lane, a big trash can there and somebody was rooting around in it. And I look up at Kevin, Kevin sees me, he knows my spirit and he stops. And I roll down my window and I say, hey, man, do you need help? And he sort of waved me off. And I realized I don't think I put it in the right tone not to assault his dignity. He and I had equal dignity. So I rephrased my question uh, with more of an open heart. And uh, he turned around and said to me, well, I'm hungry. And uh, I know my Bible, probably not as well as the pastor, but I think Jesus said something 
Like if you have two McDonald's French fries and your neighbor has none, uh, that you that you should share it. I think it might have been the Sermon on the McMount. So I sat up and reached in my bag, felt the smell, it was a little weak in my hand, but I gave him away half of my food and he seemed happy to receive it. And in that moment, I turned to look at Kevin, but he interrupted my glance in the rear view mirror and said, uh, I'm sorry, sir, do you have any socks? And I remember thinking about the question and, and immediately I, I just don't carry extra socks around my car. So I looked vainly around and I said, I'm sorry, man, I don't have any socks. Now, I knew this was a question coming from pain. In fact, one of the most requested items at a lot of the shelters I've worked at has been socks. And I felt a little bad that I couldn't help him out. And he suddenly just looked down a little bit, but smiled still and was about to go. I looked in the rearview mirror thinking Kevin would drive. But Kevin Batts, it's a man who grew up here in Newark in public housing projects, who left high school and served in the military, came back home and joined the police department been with me now for over a decade. He did not drive. He put the car in park. And next thing I know, he's rolling down his window and then reaching between his legs and kicking off his shoes and pulling off the socks that he was wearing. And he handed him out the window. And indeed, the man looks so grateful uh, for the socks, so happy. And he turned around and walked away and Kevin began driving me home. I tell you that I think we are gifted every moment of our lives an opportunity to be an agent of love and kindness. But yet often, at least I, do not infuse every moment with a moral imagination to understand the power of kindness. I've recently come across a Stanford researcher from my alma mater who's actually studied the power of an act of kindness. If King was right that we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny, well, this researcher has made real about that connection and interconnection and intersection by showing that one action witnessed by another resonates out and actually changes the energy, changes the behavior actually of other people. It's a time I often see myself sitting at home watching TV and thinking, wow, look at what they are doing or look at what they're not doing and talking about the world. But as King called upon us, I'm not doing enough to examine myself. And am I bringing love, radical love, into everything that I do every day? Are there people that I walk past are there challenges in my neighborhood even that if I stopped and used my moral imagination, used my creativity, could I find ways to make real on the potential and promise that I have to affect the entire world? Well, I tell you, I don't know if you all heard this, but uh, I ran for president last year. You, you may not know. <laughs> um, and I had a moment where I was sitting in a New York Times editorial board, days before I would drop out of the election, but they were doing a long interview with the remaining presidential candidates. And they asked me a question at the end. They said, this is a speed route. We have a number of questions, but they only got one in. And their question was simply this, and it, it stopped the meeting. Uh, they didn't get any of the other speed round questions in. They asked me about a time that my heart was broken. And the answer I gave was the last failing or failure I've made. And I share it with you to help you understand why when I read King, I'm reminded of a core belief of mine that we should never forget in any day that the biggest difference we can make in the world will most often be a small act of kindness, decency, or love. You see, up the street from me used to stand these high rise projects and uh, as a young law student, I moved to Newark, New Jersey, and then moved into those projects. I lived there for almost a decade. And I watched uh, in these tough uh, uh, living circumstances. It was really one of the better communities I've ever been a part of, but there was a lot of violence in the neighborhood at that time. Uh, uh, the buildings were infested with uh, vermin, and the elevators wouldn't work. Heat and hot water were not regular. But I tell you, the spirit in that building, the community I was a part of, 
taught me so much. I watched children literally growing up in the years that I lived there. And one group of this amazing group of kids would hang out in my lobby. And by the time they got to high school, I got to know them really, really well. Well, one of them was my dad incarnate. I, I literally thought this, he and my father were so much the same person, both grown to a single mom, both born uh, without uh, material wealth of any sort, both eventually raised by their grandparents. He, this young man, Hassan Washington, was, was three, four floors below me in these buildings. And he had whip smart, uh, 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 sort of street smarts and, and charisma and leadership ability. And he was sort of the head of this crew in the lobby of my buildings. And I would come home at night and we would stand and chat for a while. And I would go in the elevator if it worked and, or hike up the 16 flights. And I remember one night I came home in the lobby late at night and I smelled something I had not smelled quite as pungent since I was at Stanford. It was pot. And I immediately warning signs went off because look, you know, young black kids from communities like mine do not have the same margins uh, to experiment with drugs as college kids do who often see no negative uh, aspects for their experimentation. But in communities like mine, it could destroy lives. Uh, take someone down a long, wrong road uh, that could lead to imprisonment or death. And so I immediately said, I got to get involved with these kids. So I hung out in the lobby that night and I said, fellas, let's, let's go to the movies. Let's hang out more. And they were like, yeah, sure. And, and I made the mistake of letting them choose the first movie we saw uh, um, and uh, don't go see this movie or don't, don't ever rent it. Uh, it was called Saw 2, if I remember correctly. And uh, it was awful, God awful. <laughs> um, and I remember going out to the dinner with them and I, I asked them about their dreams. I remember being so touched by their, their humble dreams, beautiful dreams, achievable dreams, and motivated me to tell them, well, I know people that do this. I know people, let me get you mentors and set things up. But I tell you, I got busy. I, I didn't follow through on all the things I knew I could do if I just had the time. But what I got busy was I was running for mayor of the city of Newark. And I got so busy with the campaign that I knew in the back of my mind, oh, I'm going to help these kids. I'm going to help the kids of all the city. And, and I said, I'll have time to do it after the election. And I would come home at night and they would still be in the lobby. They wouldn't be upset that I hadn't got a chance to follow through on all the things I said I would do. They still celebrated me when I came home. I, I mean, they would cheer me. They would tell me, hey, Corey, we're going to vote for you, which I knew wasn't true. They weren't old enough to vote, but they they helped lift me on many a night. Well, I got elected. I won. I became the mayor of the city of Newark, the brass ring I had dreamed about, the position of authority and power to make a difference in my city. But right away, I had death threats on me, and, and, and the authorities had wrapped me with security and left security guards, police officers rather, in the lobby. And so when I started coming home as mayor-elect and the kids weren't in the in the lobby anymore because who wants to hang out where their police officers stationed? But I didn't I didn't think about it too much. I was running headlong into this job. Crime and violence were spiking in the communities, and I was hands on mayor. And when I got sworn in, I told people that we were going to solve big problems, and I went about my work. And as that summer went on and more shootings happened, I would show up in the streets and give street level sermons telling crowds that gathered who we were as a people, what we were capable of, what we would do together. And I'll never forget weeks into my time as mayor, I was a newly minted mayor, right two blocks from where I'm sitting right now, there was a shooting on Court Street. And I'll never forget getting there. One body was covered up, another was being loaded into an ambulance. And I, 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 there was a crowd in front of the the, the, the spot of the shooting, a senior citizen building there. And I gave my street level sermon to everybody. I didn't even barely acknowledge the, the humanity on the pavement. I was too busy ministering to the living as the new mayor of a city that would rise out of these challenges. And I still remember that moment. And I got back in the car uh, uh, being driven by my police officers and went about my day and got home that night to try to steal just a, a, a few hours of sleep, climbed the, the stairs in these projects where I was still living. And I'll never forget sitting down on my bed, pulling out my Blackberry, going through the last reports uh, of the day. And there was the homicide report. And as I scrolled through, I got stuck. Knives seemed to be jamming into the spirit of my eyes. As I got stuck, the name of the dead person on that pavement covered by a sheet, the homicide victim, 
was Hassan Washington. I, I broke that day, and I don't think I've ever healed. I hurt something awful. You see, because my dad grew up to a single mom in the mountains of North Carolina, raised uh, uh, until he was a teenager and then taken in by other families in the community. And he, he, he used to say he got to where he was because of a conspiracy of love, because of all the acts of people who saw things in him that he didn't see in himself. My father couldn't afford to go to college, but people in that community took a collection to help him uh, afford a, a, a to a role in North Carolina Central University. He tells the story of the conspiracy of love at every point of his life. People seem to intervene to help him take another step forward beyond his hopes, even beyond his dreams. And here God put a young boy in front of me who so was that story of my father, gave me a chance not to pay it back, but to pay it forward. And I failed to follow through. Well, I remember his funeral. It was at Perry's funeral home, just uh, about a mile from where I'm sitting. And, and it's a, a funeral home where I've been too many times for too many boys, too many children killed in my community. And it was, the funeral was in the basement of that building. And I'll never forget, I used to hate that room for some reason, because I always felt like I was descending into the bowel of a ship. And there we were on that day, all chained together in grief, piled in on top of each other, moaning and groaning and swaying and wailing for what is an American tradition, an immoral one, another dead black boy. In a, and I was the new mayor. And I will tell you right now, I, I, I was not mayoral. I, people coming to me to lean upon me and my light, but my light seemed to be snuffed out. And I'm embarrassed to admit to you that I left. I ran. I could not stay. I felt too much shame and too much hurt. And I ran back out of that funeral home into my new SUV, drove uh, to my office, ran into it, closed the door, and sat down on the couch. And for the first time as mayor of New Jersey's largest city, I wept. And all I could think about was we were all there, crowded in that funeral home, all there for his death. But where were we for his life? King is slain. So many others have come before us. Goodman, Cheney, Schwarner, I can tell you the names of the martyrs to an ideal. You can call that ideal democracy. You can call that ideal many names from many faiths, but it, it all boils down to us, to who we are as individuals, to the power of our love, the grandeur of our imagination, and our ability every day to be good to one another. This community we live in, this nation we're proud of, is hurting today. I don't know if I have the power of the great alchemists of love in the past that somehow found ways with grand gestures and speeches and protests and work to change hate into love. I, I don't know if I have the solutions to all of our nation's problems, but I know that those solutions lie within the heart of each of us as individuals. King called upon us to examine ourselves. Jesus called us on us to love one another every day without exceptions, to pour out our hearts, to give our best measure of devotion to all of God's children. I end by taking you to that point of pain the king died. If you go there, the Lorraine Motel, I got chills when I looked down and I saw a block of stone and I read the stone and there was scripture written in there, words from the Torah, words from the Quran, words from the Bible. And, and the words are the words of Joseph's brothers. They're actually words that were uttered in hate. They, they, that, that Joseph's brothers uttered these words right before they grabbed Joseph with his coat of many colors and threw him into a well to die. Well, I, I do feel that we're in that well right now. I do feel that we're in that darkness, but you know the story of Joseph. He didn't die in that well. He rose up and helped to lead a nation out of darkness. What are the words written there where King 
was slain on a block of stone at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. It's simply this, behold, here cometh the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what becomes of his dream. Well, King has been slain, but we must answer the question, what will become of his dream? And I say that each one of us, if we dream and follow those dreams with love and work and sacrifice for others, I tell you, we may be down in a well now, but we will rise up together. Each of us connected one to another, illuminating, inspiring, engaging, other souls, we will light up the sky, cast away the darkness, and perhaps maybe, maybe if we love like that and dream like that and work like that, maybe we can bring about the era that King spoke of when he said he went to the mountaintop, that we can bring about in this land more of a promised land where justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you, and God bless you. Let all the people in all the places that we are say amen. I give thanks to God today for prophets and preachers, for the ways that spirit moves uh, among us, and for the way that spirit has spoken through her beloved one, Cory Booker, today. It's a word that my heart and spirit needed to receive. And I give great thanks. I invite us now into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I pray today that you might help our spirits, minds, hearts receive this powerful word, this call, this invitation to humble ourselves, to recognize the moments when we have not done what we could do for the sake of kindness for the conspiracy of love that you have been about from the very beginning. We pray that you would touch hearts and minds, that you would open us more fully to continue living the dream that we are called to build together. Guide us in your way. Help us rise together to live as you would have us live, as one family, united in love, in justice, and in peace. Amen. Friends, now we'll receive an invitation to give from Pastor Ben. Thank you, Pastor Ginger. Friends, your gifts that you give here at Foundry help to continue the ministry of seeking to build beloved community. You can participate in some of that work this month by registering for the annual point in time survey and the Foundry team that will administer the count for the DuPont Circle neighborhood. It helps nonprofits and the government here in DC uh, decide where to put the resources so that we are meeting better the needs of our unhoused neighbors. Foundry will take this on at the end of the month and we invite you to join the team either as a, a pair from your household, as roommates or spouses, uh, anybody that is within your little COVID bubble that you can walk with uh, throughout the evening. You can contact me at broberts at foundryumc.org. Just check the links in the comment section, or you can register right away using the links that are being posted now. But for now, we invite you to receive this prayer and then move to the offering links on your screen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, for everything that has been offered this day, we give our thanks and we ask that you would bless the gifts that are being given. Help them to be used for kingdom building for justice, for peace, for mercy, not only at Foundry Church, but in our community and indeed around the world. And all this we pray through Jesus' name, amen. And now friends, we invite you to move to the webpage or the links in the comments section as we give and receive this gift from our virtual chamber singers.
receiving, becoming God's love. Imagine the people of God. Imagine, imagine the people of God. Imagine the people of God. Caring, sharing God's love in the world. hard to follow. <laughs> um, and now, friends, we invite you to join us as we sing together hymn number 500 in the African American Heritage Hymnal, Glory, Glory, Hallelujah, as originally recorded at Foundry in 2019. You'll find the words shown in the lower third of the live stream and printed in your worship guide. <laughs>
Friends, thank you so much for joining us today for worship. Our prayer is that you have been both blessed and challenged and inspired for the living of these days. Once again, we share our deep gratitude to Senator Cory Booker for being present with us. And he hung in for a few minutes to get a little bit of that follow up to the to the word and, and to see some more of the service and then had to get to the next thing um, that he is called upon to do in his in his very challenging and important work. So we're grateful that he was able to come and be with us today. We hope that you'll stick around for a moment and continue to be in community together, share coffee uh, through our Zoom coffee hour, our online coffee hour, and also to check in with us to let us know you've been present if you haven't already done that. We would so love to know that you've been with us today. Also want to take just a moment uh, to invite our Director of Music Ministry, Stanley Thurston, to let us know about an exciting um, class that he's going to help a conversation he's going to going to share with us so stanley tell us about it thank you pastor we invite the entire foundry community to join us on saturday february the 13th at 10 o'clock a.m for a zoom webinar discussion we will view excerpts of a conversation on cultural appropriation and give our own feedback and thoughts on that conversation so we hope you'll tune in register for the uh, zoom webinar and we'll have a great discussion. Thank you so much. Um, our maestro, Stanley Thurston, is going to be part of the original discussion, and it sounds like it's going to be amazing. So I hope you'll tune in for that. And also, don't leave too soon if you have a few more minutes, because our postlude today is, is just the capper to this amazing music today. So don't miss it. Um, once again, we're so glad you've been with us. May... The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make her face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let us go into the world sharing kindness and love in all that we do. Go in peace and power. Amen. <laughs>